Good morning, church. Um, today I'm going to read the scripture of uh, Luke 6, um, verse 12 till 26. I read in Jesus' name. One of those days, Jesus went out to, the, to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying for God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom also designed these apostles. Simon, who, named, uh, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of um, James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a le level place. A large crowd of this, his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judah, from Jerusalem, and from the coast coastal region around Tri and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, cured. And the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who, who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that, that day and lead for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated their prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who, who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everybody speaks well at you, for that is how their ancestors treated their false prophets. Thank you all for listening. You guys listen to podcasts? Yeah? Well, I was listening to a podcast this week, uh, and I listen to it every week. It's a, it's a Dutch podcast called uh, The Ongelooflijke Podcast. It's a podcast about uh, faith and society and secularism and uh, all kinds of stuff. And this week they were talking to a man with the name Tim, uh, Tim Schongers. And I have a photo of Tim on the screen behind me. Uh, Tim just finished writing a book. And the book is called, it's a, Dutch, it's a book in Dutch, but in English it, it translates as uh, explaining poverty to people with money. Because he, 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 you know, he lived in poverty and, and he figured out that you know, people with money don't really know and feel what, what it is like. And so this Tim actually is a local fellow. He grew up in Antwerp uh, in a very poor kind of home in our city where he grew up without a toilet in his house, where he grew up with surviving on uh, a sandwich with a frikandelle inside for a number of weeks because that was just cheap and it fills your stomach, but it's not very healthy. At the age of 11, uh, Tim began to clean dog houses in the neighborhood for two years of 50 a night. Uh, not to keep the money for himself, you know, and to buy some toys, but to support the family budget. And this is Tim's story, but I looked up some numbers this week, and in the city of Antwerp, 28% of all people in our city live in poverty. Now, poverty in, in Antwerp, in Belgium, of course, is, is different from poverty in other places in the world, but still, 28% of people in Antwerp, which is about 150,000 people in our city, are struggling to survive and pay the bills at the end of this month. There are people who are poor, there are people who are hungry, there are people who are sad and lonely and rejected in our own city and maybe in our own church. And then we find Jesus saying in Luke chapter 6, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. It's a very different kind of blessing than what we, we would think of, you know, as a blessing, right? I mean, when, when would you say that you're blessed? Uh, just look around on, on the internet, on social media, you know, people post all this good stuff of how God is blessing them and how they're having a blessed day. And usually it is people who are successful, uh, they made it, their bank accounts are full, they're traveling the world, they're having nice dinners and parties. You say, you know, God is blessing me. It's a new day. God is good. Amen. But Jesus here says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who are being rejected. It's a, a different kind of thing. Jesus teaches us this morning a, a different perspective, you could say, on life. A different way of looking at the world. A different way of looking what really matters. And he helps us to look at, at the present and, and our current situation, but also he helps us to look to the future because he promises that at some point in the future there is a blessing in store for those who are suffering now. And so we find Jesus uh, in his ministry has just been... Um, Praying for an entire night, we've just read. I don't know when is the last time you spent a whole night in prayer, but that's something that Jesus did, and maybe that's why this crossover service is, is a good idea. He prayed the entire night, and early morning when the sun comes up, he calls his disciples with him, and he appoints 12 of them, and he calls them now apostles. So they change from disciples, from students, from followers to, to apostles. Those, those are being sent. And then we read that the whole crowd is still there and they bring all the, the sick and those with impure spirits with him and he heals them and he cures them because power is going out of him. And then he begins his speech. It says, the word says here, to his disciples. But we assume that, you know, the disciples and the apostles and all the crowd are, are listening in. And Jesus begins his kind of weird speech saying, blessed are you who are poor? Blessed are you who are hungry or weeping or rejected. And then he says, woe to you who are rich and well fed and all these things. So this morning I want to pause at, at three things with you. Uh, number one, uh, God's promise to those who are suffering. Uh, secondly, God's warning to the rich. And thirdly, will think and reflect that God's kingdom, of course, will come in all its fullness in the future, but is already beginning right now. Is this not working? Okay. Uh, let me turn this off. All right. Yes. Uh, is this better? Yeah. I hear myself in this monitor. I don't know if that's needed, but... Um, yeah, so Jesus says that those who are poor and hungry and weeping and are rejected because of his name are, are blessed or blessed. And the Greek word that's being used there is, is makarios. And makarios means something like, you know, being happy or fortunate or being blessed. And uh, in Greek society, this word would typically apply to, to the upper class, those who made it. Uh, those who were, you know, sitting in their comfortable houses. But this word would not describe the, the servants and the slaves that were present in Greek society. But it's almost as if Jesus is turning things around. He says, in the kingdom of God, things work a different kind of way. It is not the upper class in the kingdom of God that receives blessing, according to this passage at least. But Jesus makes a case for those who are hungry and poor and rejected and alone and weeping. And this means that God cares about the needy. 
And this is something that we see all throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, that God is a God of, yes, of mercy and grace, but a God also of justice, who fights for the oppressed, who protects the widowers, who protects the orphans, who protects the strangers. And in this case, protects those who are hungry and promises them to be filled. And it, cares that, and it means that God cares about people, maybe in this room, who are struggling to put bread on the table each month. It means that God cares about people who struggle to, to pay the rent. It means that God sees you in your suffering. God sees you when you are weeping. God sees you when you are being rejected for his name's sake. And some of you know how that feels like. God knows it. God sees it. God cares about it. And he says that anything that you like now, at some point in the future, when God's kingdom will come in all its fullness, there will be an abundance of blessing for you. But yet, it feels kind of unfair, isn't it? I mean, you may be a person of, of, you know, of good intentions, and you may be serving the Lord and seeking Him and His kingdom, and yet, still there is inequality and poverty and you, you, your struggles. Well, you're not the first one to, to have that observation. In Psalm 73, you can look it up, Psalm 73 is a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph had a kind of similar experience. He, he looked around in the world. He said that, you know, there are a whole bunch of people out there. They don't look for you, God, but they seem to be doing well. They're healthy, they're strong, their finances are going well. But for me, you know, I'm trying to seek you, Lord, but my food almost slipped. I almost lost my faith because I don't see that prosperity in my life. He says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. And he goes on to observe how this world seems so unjust and how the, the, the godless seem to be doing well. But then in verse 16, he says, when I try to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. You see, what Asaph is doing here and what Jesus is doing in Luke 6 is he puts our life in an eternal perspective. Now, we serve a God who is from eternity to eternity. A God who was there yesterday, who is there today, and who will be there tomorrow. And our life on this earth is, is a speck of dust compared to our eternal destination. And God says, I see your suffering, I see your hunger, I see your weeping, I see your poverty, and I care about it. But look at the, that bigger perspective. Look at eternity. If you are a part of my kingdom, if you are my son, if you are my daughter, you'll spend an eternity with God. And he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And he will restore unto you what you lack at this moment. Romans 8 says the following. Paul says, I consider that our, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will re be revealed in us. Now, I think the Bible is not trying to idealize poverty. The Bible is not saying that, you know, okay, this is okay, and there will be some time in the future that everything will be all right, and, you know, just accept things as they are. We'll get to that later, but Jesus is, is putting our lives in an eternal perspective and promising a better future. And I think this is very important because this may be the very foundation almost of life. This gives hope. You see, if you do not believe in any God, as many people do, and you believe the reason why we exist in this world is just a pure coincidence and an accidental happening, and you are here, and there may be no purpose in life, 
You begin this kind of YOLO life. Right? You only live once. You get out of it what is in it. It's very empty. But Jesus says your life is, is bigger than, than this life. So even if you suffer in this life, there's a, a bigger life waiting for you. And if you don't make it in this life, that's not the end. And it is such a freeing idea that this life, there's more than just this life. And that, God, that your life is eternal. We believe in a God who can put our, our mourning into dancing. We believe in a God who will wipe away the tears from our eyes. And you know what? Without idealizing poverty at all, going through struggles in life, it, it teaches us to depend on God. If you are poor, and depending on the support of others, you will draw to God and, and say, God, I need you to, serve this, to, to solve this issue. If you are hungry and you don't know how to survive, you'll call on the name of God and say, God, I need you to feed my kids. If you are sad, you will go to God and say, God, I need you to comfort me. And God who sees you, who knows you, will answer. On the opposite, and this is maybe where it gets into the, the warning to the ridge, uh, there is a danger for arrogance. You know, we people, most of us, I, I would say, we are people with money. And there is a danger to it, a spiritual danger. Um, remember this guy, uh, Tim, who grew up in, uh, here in Antwerp. At some point, he was able to escape his sort of poverty. He was a smart guy. He went to school. He got a bachelor's, got a master's, and uh, started an office job. And for him, it was as if he was entering into a different world almost. Now, he used to work long hours, you know, 60 hours a week uh, in restaurant kitchens, cleaning and cooking, and he said, you know, I usually didn't really care about how I, how I would dress up. Just put on some clothing and I would go, I would work hard, many hours, get paid little. If you don't show up a few times on time in the kitchen, you know, you'll be, you'll be fired. And then, after his master's, you know, he got a nice office job, and he was working 32 hours a week. And then, you know, he could work a few days from home because, you know, there's this work-life balance. And then you get paid to sit on your own chair in your own home, and you get paid and reimbursed for using your own laptop. And the times he went to the office, he noticed people dress up, and they care about how they look like, they care about their makeup. The kind of words they use are different. The kind of events they go to are different. The kind of music they listen to are different. It's a different life. And he noticed that, you know, if I come late at my, at my, at my hard working job in the restaurant, you know, if I come late a few times, they'll fire me. But he noticed that, you know, people with money sometimes are pretty lazy. They come late at the office a few minutes, a few times a week, and, and nobody seems to care. He noticed that during meetings, you know, at the office, people would drink coffee, and when the meeting is over, they just leave the, leave the dirty cups on the table, assuming that some cleaning lady would come up and fix it. And he had been working on that side of the spectrum. He said, you know, how, how shameful it is that you just don't pick up your cup and put it in the dishwasher, put it in the sink, but you assume that someone else will take care of it. Now, I'm not trying to say that you know, being rich or, 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 or wealthy is a bad thing. I don't, I don't think the Bible says that. But I think the Bible says that there is a spiritual danger that comes with, with wealth and money. Because riches come with, with social status. And there, there's, a, there's a risk to become kind of arrogant and to build in a self-security. If, if we have our money, we have our comfort, we don't, need a, we don't need God. If our fridge is full with stuff, then do we need God for our daily bread? 
if we have everything we want? Do we need God to provide for our needs? Do we, need, do we seek God? Those who love and enjoy life may, may get too busy with the pursuit of life itself and, and forget God, and God slowly fades out of the, the picture. Last Tuesday, last Tuesday night, we had this uh, training with Gasfrei Geschenk, and I met a man called Misael. And Misael goes to a Spanish-speaking church. And uh, that church has been around for a while, and they're very active in serving uh, the homeless in Antwerp. Every Thursday night, they go out, they serve food to the people on the street, and also offer prayer. And so one night, Misael was, uh, was out there, and he had, he had been stressed. He, you know, he had bought a house, and... Um, he wanted to renovate his kitchen. He wanted a nicer, better, good-looking kitchen. And he had no money. And he was kind of stressed. You know, how am I going to make this work? And I need to put in maybe an extra job. And, you know, I need to get this kitchen. And then on Thursday night, he went out on a winter night to serve those homeless people with some food. And after being out for a couple hours, his fingers were frozen you know, his nose was blown up, his body was shivering, you know, he's from the Dominican Republic, not built for Belgian weather. But he returned home and he said, well, I have a warm home, I have a soft bed, and there are people out here who have to stay out the entire night in this cold, sleeping on the street. And pretty quickly his kitchen problem was not so big of a deal anymore. You see, there's nothing wrong with being rich, but there is a, a danger that if the more we have, the more worries we have in a way. The less we depend on God and the more we become obsessed with ourselves and our things and our needs. And Jesus says, woe to you who are rich, woe to you who have all these things, woe to you where your bellies are full. But blessed are those who are hungry. And so it leads us to the third point is that the kingdom of God is now. Of course, what Jesus is saying here is that there is going to be a moment when Christ returns at the end of time where God's kingdom will be installed in all its fullness and God will restore everything and bring perfect justice. There's a promise for the future, but God is not a God who lets us sit and wait his kingdom has already begun here and now. When God chose Mary to carry Jesus in her womb, Mary sang this song that we know as the Magnificat. And what does she say? She prays me to God because he chose his humble servant, a poor young girl, to carry Christ in her womb. When Jesus began his ministry, we, you know, we're doing this series on the Spirit of Christ. When Jesus begins, begins his ministry in Luke chapter 4, he quotes from Isaiah 61. What does he say? I'm coming to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, freedom for those who are captive, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So God's kingdom, in part, is already beginning right now. And so, if you look at the life of Jesus, he, he hang out. He hang out with, with the sinners and the outcasts and the poor and the, the prostitutes. And I think today, if Jesus was here in Antwerp, you know, he would hang out with those donkeys on the street and the homeless and the prostitutes and maybe not so much with the CEOs of all those big companies and the guys who made it. Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor and hungry and weeping and rejected. Re Jesus redefines the world, the present and the future. It's kind of a radical rethinking of life, and I think it helps us to approach life a different way. Because if, this, if, if in this life we, we want to make it, we want to be successful, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the ultimate goal of life. You can be rich and have it all, and yet, if you, don't have, if you don't have God, it's a poor, empty enterprise. Yet the other way around, if you're suffering this life, but you know God, you may be the richest person in the world. 
because you know that one day God will turn your morning into dancing, that he will have a better future for you in store, and that knowing God himself is better than life. Now, there's one category that we didn't really speak of much in, in verses uh, 22 and 23. We've spoken a lot about, you know, the hungry and the, the poor, and those who are weeping, and all, all of, a lot of times those things are combined, right? It's not all the individual different people, but this could be all tangled up into one life. Poor and hungry and uh, weeping and being sad. But there's also this one. It says, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And then follows what is the only command in this passage. The command is, Rejoice! in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets and we know that you know the people of Israel how they treated the prophets who were bringing the word of God they didn't listen were rejected now persecution and being insulted because of the name of Christ is, doesn't seem to be much of a, of a big deal in Antwerp although these last weeks there have been some frustrations uh, from people you're not being able to use certain buildings for religious events such as, as Lifeline or other churches who are looking for a place and they're being turned down all the time because they're doing religious activities. Uh, I know some people f find it difficult, you know, be in the university and be a believer and everybody's looking down on you, but that's not really a big deal compared to what other people go through in life. Other people are really physically excluded from the community and insulted and sometimes killed because of their faith in Jesus. And yet, Jesus calls them to rejoice and to leap for joy. Now, I know one man who serves as a good example of this. And some of you know his story a little bit. I'm talking about Omar. I got to know Omar a couple of years ago as he was staying in a Belgian prison and he was uh, convicted for piracy on the Somalian coast. And he was involved in the hijacking of a Belgian ship. And was brought to Belgium and served like a nine-year prison sentence that ended up actually being ten years. A rough guy. He had fought in some militias and then got into piracy. He was ten years in jail. And through a prison chaplain that I know, I got to learn about Omar. And uh, began to, with a few phone calls, and got to know him. And began to visit him in prison, and at some point I gave him a Bible. He was really interested, so we began to do Bible studies together, and a discipleship course, kind of over the phone and through some visits, and at some point he was really on fire for the Lord and wanted to get baptized. So Pastor Zeke and I and, another, and this chaplain went into this prison uh, and baptized him. There were a few inmates were there with him too. It was a wonderful moment. Only a few months later, uh, I got this message on my, on my phone saying, Omar is on his way to Mogadishu, and he sends you his greetings. Now, Mogadishu, uh, after, you know, Mogadishu, Somalia, after North Korea, is, this, is the world's second most dangerous country in the world for Christians. People get killed because of being a Christian. Now, Omar goes there with a suitcase full of Bibles uh, into Mogadishu. We were all very nervous, and God has been good. His, for some reason, his dad uh, took him into the house. You know, his dad usually would be the first one to kick him out of the family because he's bringing shame on the family for leaving Islam and becoming Christian. But it's dangerous out there. There's Al-Shabaab, some militias are in, in the neighborhood. Uh, people figured out about Omar. Uh, some, sometimes they began to search his house, and he was hiding his Bible under the ground. And so we helped him escape, and now he is in a neighboring country out there. But although Omar faced rejection and insults because of his faith in Jesus, every time I talk to him, he says, Jan, I'm good. Jan, I'm happy. I know Jesus. I am a happy man. This man understands what it means to rejoice in the Lord and to leap with joy 
just because of knowing God. And the last years, with the last year or so, we've been supporting him a little bit. But he is living a very basic life. He doesn't have a job at the moment. Um, and so, I think if God cares about people in need, if God cares about the poor and the hungry and those who are weeping, if God cares about those who are being rejected and promising them a, a bright future, then wouldn't God care also now? And can we not be involved in the thing that God is already doing in the world? And so, I've begun a fundraiser for Omar. I, I, like, to, I like for him to have a car and uh, begin his own taxi service. You know, he's out there. He can, you know, we're now supporting him every month, but you know, it's, it's good for him to be on his own, uh, drive around his car, meet people, talk about Jesus. Uh, this is all good. So if you want to be involved in God's work in the world, uh, scan that QR code. There's a GoFundMe page that I set up. We're trying to raise about 7,000 euros for a second-hand car. So Omar, we can begin to ride his, his taxi and continue spreading the good news because this is something he cannot stop. He knows the consequences. He knows the pains. But he loves Jesus and he can't stop. Okay, let's wrap up here. I think what we've seen is that Jesus is teaching us a different way of looking at life, right? Different way of looking at the world. God cares about the poor. God cares about the needy. And the biggest blessing is not financial success. The biggest blessing we can have is not anything in this world, but the biggest blessing we have is knowing God. And in this perspective of eternity, God will work out all things for the good. God cares about the poor. God cares about your needs. And God invites us to participate in his work. And just for you to know that throughout the ages, Christians have done this. Christians have began hospitals and schools and orphanages. In our church, there are people serving with food banks. And, and clothing banks and reaching out to immigrants because we believe God cares about them, God loves them, and if God cares, then we should care. So let's go into this week. Uh, I don't know what is on your schedule, but if you have a chance to do good in the world, and participate in the work that God is already doing, uh, take part and go in with your whole heart. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are good and that your love endures forever. But we thank you that you care and have a special place in your heart, Lord, for those who are suffering. That you fight for the oppressed. That you restore the broken. That you heal the sick. And Lord, that we live on your promises, Lord, that whatever we'll be going through now, Lord, now that one day we will see you face to face and be in your presence. You will wipe away all the tears from our eyes and that we are called blessed in your name. God, we pray at this very moment for people in our church who may be struggling financially to pay the bills, maybe to put food on the table. Lord, you know them. And you, Lord, you know the shame that comes with it and the difficulty of asking for help. Lord, we pray that we as a church will care about each other as you care for us. Lord, we pray for the city of Antwerp, Lord, and people on the streets and people in poverty. Lord, we pray that churches and ministries who are involved in this, Lord, that you will bless them with abundance, Lord, of resources and finances and people who will serve the needy. And Lord, raise up in us a spirit of participating, Lord, with your good work. Lord, you are a God of mercy. And your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we thank you for all the good things you have done to us. And Lord, help us now to pass them on to others. We thank you, Lord, that our lives are eternal lives. And that, Lord, in you there is hope and joy and power and restoration and fullness, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your work on the cross. Thank you that you died for us. 
so that we can live a resurrection life. Father, be with us in the remainder of this service. Bless us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We're now going to sing another song, and this song ties in well with the message. It's called All the Poor and Powerless and All the Lost and Lonely and how God cares for them. Let's sing praises to God. <laughs> 